so I, for, for when I was in college for photography, I did a lot of minimalism. And so my portfolio is really based around minimalism. And you could define that as just very basic shapes and tones and lines in an image. And that's what I have gone for in the past with uh, my photography. Here's one of my better images. Here's another one in Madeira Beach, uh, like six in the morning with a long, we call a long exposure. So the shutter is open for a long time, gathering a lot of light when there's not much light in the environment. And here's one doing the opposite where there's a lot of light in the environment and I use the shutter to reduce the amount of light in the photograph. So this is a very fast shutter speed when there's you know full sun out in, in the actual environment. It's another one of my images called Pay on Your Reservoir. Again, just you know, simple tones. There's probably only three colors in here and simple lines. And this is how you get kind of that painterly effect. And I use a long lens, called a long lens, and that, that allows me to kind of reduce what I see down to just a piece of nature. So, you know, you look at a whole scene and there's a lot of things going on and you say, oh, I want that that bird or I want that little branch you can use a long lens and it'll zoom you all the way into that little piece of the scene this is the other thing I've been doing so I take all my photographic uh, work and I will put it into a gallery and display it in a way that is a lot different from the, the framed image and this is actually a collaborative um, installation with my classmates for our final project and what I did was I took I took their imagery that they gave me and I printed up these huge panels of all their imagery most of it while they're uh, at school at Colorado Mountain College and then I printed it on this stuff called Picturico and Picturico is a transparent film and it transmits light and so I made these false walls you can see that are out from the framed print on the wall behind and then I lit those false walls from behind uh, and it, it turned out pretty cool you know it, um, the images there was a lot of images so there was a lot of tones and a lot of information and, and people really enjoyed that it was lit up and kind of glowed and, and encapsulated the the framed print that you see on the wall that every student had to leave behind And while I've been in Highlands, I've been shooting the waterfalls at night. So I've gone around to all the waterfalls, shot them at night. And the reason that's, uh, you know, maybe a better time to shoot them is you can do a long exposure and get this milky effect on the waterfall itself rather than it being just a snap of that waterfall. You start to, the water starts to run and starts to create, you know, cool effects within the image. And the night sky, you know, it's kind of a different, a different look that you get to the waterfall than you normally see. Here's another image called uh, Secret Falls. Maybe you guys have been to some of these just at night. Okay, so we call it capture when you capture an image. So this is just kind of the basics of how to capture an image with that pro camera app that I introduced you guys to in, in, the, uh, in the other video. And this video should help you kind of with setting that app up um, for different ways you want an image to look. So proper exposure is a combination of three things. 
um, the shutter speed, which is easy to adjust on the app. The ISO, also very easy to adjust on the app. Um, the aperture is not so easy to adjust on the app. That's more of a, 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 a function of a camera lens because a camera lens will have these blades and the blades open and close, kind of like the iris of your eye. But in a normal camera, those three things make up what will expose the image and you can adjust those three things, aperture, shutter, ISO, um, in order to get different effects within the image. So like here, using aperture with the lens, the, the whole image is, is sharp, right? So I have, I have the aperture as high, it's like f16. Um, and that keeps, when the aperture is high, it's kind of like it's very narrowed down. So the image is very sharp. Conversely, if I take the aperture down, and number like to four or three or 2.8 the image starts to become blurry and you can see there's kind of one line of, of sharpness right through the head they're almost like right behind the head and the rest of the image is blurry and that's because the aperture is very open and it's causing the image to be blurry except for one little slice so that's one look you can get with that slider the auto manual slider that I showed you guys you can blur part of the image, you can blur all the image, and that starts to make some cool effects. So this is what happens with ISO. So you can, you can bump ISO way up, and you can do that at night and get some cool images at night, but the problem is they're very noisy. So you have to compensate with either shutter speed or aperture for this noise and this is a kind of a setup shot I used for making the final waterfall shot and the problem with this image is it's practically unusable because of so much noise and this was at the highest ISO the the camera can go with so you got to be careful how high you go with the ISO because you can get this this noisy image and it might not be kind of what you want but one thing that photographers do a lot is they'll, they'll go high ISO image and they'll take that image and turn it into black and white. And then that looks kind of cool because a lot of black and white images have, have noise. So you can examine that or we, I can show you guys at another time how to change them into black and white. And here's just the, the final image, you know, a lot more drama in it, a whole lot less noise, um, better tones, sky looks better. So at a lower ISO, it becomes more usable. It's just a long shutter speed to get to this point. I think this is like a minute, whereas that other one was two seconds. So with shutter speed, and here I'm using action as an example, with a high shutter speed you can capture action because the, the shutter is going faster than that, that little hockey player can move, so he gets frozen in action. Whereas if you start to drop the shutter speed, he gets, starts to get blurry because it's not snapping fast enough to capture the action. So one way we use shutter speed is to capture action and we you have to do it like if you're shooting sports you got to do it at one over two thousand so that's two thousandths of a second very very fast and then you can freeze the action of sports at that high shutter speed because no athlete can really move faster than two thousandths of a second Here you can see kind of a lower shutter speed where things are starting to get blurry. Players are starting to blur. The action doesn't look as frozen. Um, you can use this effect to get some cool, cause some cool looks in the image. But if you are shooting sports, you want to bump that shutter speed way up so that this doesn't happen.
Okay, so the important part of that app that you have is white balance. And it gives you a number of options for white balance. And what I'm wanting to relate to you here is the temperature of light. So the light coming out of the tungsten bulb is a different temperature than the light of the sun. So the white balance will compensate for that. And you can see this image looks really different in different white balance settings. And the reason it's, it looks different is it's saying, okay, in tungsten light, um, it's very yellow. So I'm going to make white very blue. And if I take tungsten light, tungsten, you know, light bulb light into a, a sunny image, it's going to be very, very blue. And then your tutorial about ProCam, I took a picture under tungsten or fluorescent light and it was very blue. And that's the reason why, because it's compensating for light that really isn't there. Whereas if I took the tungsten setting and went inside and took a picture, it would look pretty good. Conversely, if I had it set to daylight and I took it inside and it was tungsten, it wouldn't look so hot. So that's that's what white balance is, is it's the temperature of the light. And here you can see the actual temperatures in Kelvin that they met. They use Kelvin to measure light. So you can see what light is in the Kelvin scale using this chart. So if you go straight up to noon, that's kind of the strongest the sun is. Clear noon day, 5500K. Um, you know when the sun starts to turn or the sky starts to turn blue, it goes up in temperature according to Kelvin. So you, you know, get that blue twilight sky. That's very blue, high in the in the Kelvin scale. Um, so this just takes sort of some of the well-known um, sources of light and drops them into that Kelvin scale for you. So you can start to understand, okay, what is the temperature of light? And that's useful because you have that white balance slider. And the white balance slider goes um, on temperature. So when you start to slide it, it'll change the temperature of the Kelvin and you can actually start to match up the Kelvin with the source of light rather than using the auto white balance functions or like the, the cloudy or the fluorescent, you can start to match them up on your own and they might be slightly different. That's why they have that, that slider is, you know, not every source of light is the same. So that the slider allows you to, to sort of adjust slightly to that source of light if it's a little bit different than a than a preset